So our speaker today is Matt Edwards. Uh, Matt's career began, he did his undergraduate degree at UC Santa Barbara, so go Gauchos. And then he came to Moss Landing for his master's degree. He worked with Mike Foster. Uh, he was here for a number of oh, years, years, a number of years, and had a lot of fun. Uh, spent a lot of his time working in kelp forests in Stillwater Cove, looking at the effects of disturbance and the removal of kelp canopies on benthic communities. He branched out to work quite a bit on one species of, of seaweed, Desmarestia, the acid weed, and really looking at its life history, life cycle patterns of recruitment. Uh, after he finished his master's degree, he moved really far away to UC Santa Cruz uh, for his PhD, where he started with Gymnestes. And I think he was planning to go work in the Aleutians and do some stuff with kelp and otters and all that stuff. <laughs> but he went down on a trip before he sort of started his research with Diana, I think, right, to go study some rotol beds mm -hmm. in Baja and, just, and heard that, hey, there's this giant El Nino coming and said, well, screw the work in Alaska. Let's go study the effects of the El Nino on giant kelp throughout its range. And that became his PhD. When he finished his PhD, he became a professor at San Diego State and got working in the Lucian kelp systems. He's been doing that for the last uh, decade or so. Uh, he also does a lot of work, continues to do work on the ecology and the physiology of seaweeds, working in uh, Mexico and Baja, California, down in San Diego and Southern California, up here still a little bit, uh, working on the effects of climate change on seaweeds, you know, really getting involved in a lot of different things, aquaculture, and uh, you know, last year he was our visiting scientist here at Moss Landing, which was excellent. Uh, I was able to teach two classes with him, which was really, really a joy. And, and he's really been instrumental in helping us to develop the ideas for the Center for Aquaculture. Um, that's really starting to take off now. So, you know, with that, thanks for coming back and helping to teach our marine ecology class today and giving the seminar. And uh, yeah, Matt Edwards talking about uh, changes <coughs> in uh, leaching and kelp forest ecosystems. Thanks. I guess it's better than saying that I got to study acid and weed for grad school. Um, <laughs> so it's it's always nice to come back. Although you know, I'm not, I don't really feel like I'm coming back. I feel like I was just here. I was, and so. A lot of times I'm walking down the hall and people look and going, didn't weren't you just here? Um, I, get, I get that a lot, actually. Um, and then uh, um, the other thing is it's always nice to walk down the, th the hall and see your flyers out there and realize that, you know, the, there's pictures of you standing there in your underwear for your flyer. It's rice and underwear, but still. <laughs> so thanks, Scott, for that introduction. Um, I am going to be talking about one line of my research. Um, as Scott measured, I've been primarily interested in kelp horse ecology of a really coastal um, ecology and, um, and hard bottom uh, systems. I'm really focusing on how disturbances impact um, kelp forest systems. Um, I worked a lot with the giant kelp forest along our coast from just north of here all the way down through Baja. I did that for about 12 years. Um, I've been doing a lot of stuff in uh, San Diego, working with my students on physiology and physiological um, responses to varying environmental conditions. But as Scott said, one of the things I was able to do is I was able to get an opportunity to go up to the Aleutian Islands and work in the, some of the kelp forest systems up there. I'm going to talk about that. Um, a little bit that uh, set up for that today. And really what we've done, I've been working with a colleague of mine, Brenda Konar, who's also a former student of Mike Foster here, um, who I overlapped a little bit both here and in Jim Estes' lab at Santa Cruz. And we've taken this story that some of you may have heard about. If not, I'm going to just touch on it today. That's not really where the, the talk today is about. But I want to talk about some of the bigger picture things that we've been looking at following this wide scale kelp loss throughout the Aleutian Archipelago. So if I were to come up with a title, um, it would be something like ecosystem level responses to widespread kelp loss in the Aleutian Archipelago, a, a tale of three studies. I'm going to give you three studies. And those of you who have seen all the WSN talks I've given over the past five years, you're going to kind of see a lot of this stuff's going to be familiar. I'm really putting together <coughs> three top talks into a conceptual framework. Um, and I was thinking about what might another talk be. It might be something like the ballad of the Aleutian kelp force in three-part harmony. So having said that, um, <clears throat> once again, you know, looking at kelp forest systems along the coast, um, <clears throat> one of the things we understand kelp forests are very important for is they have a really large ecological importance. Um, they're huge uh, uh, areas for recruitment of, say, juvenile finfish and vertebrates. They house a whole number of adult species, all sorts of understory algae that go with the kelp forest. Um, marine mammals, seabirds, and all sorts of things. They're really hot spots of diversity along our coast. In addition to their ec uh, the ecological importance, they're economically important. Um, they're big, uh, big grounds for ecotourism, diving, um, recreational commercial fisheries. Kelp used to be harvest. This is now a fairly defunct uh, industry. 
um, as the big large scale kelp harvesters have moved out of California due to permitting issues, excuse me. Um, however, oh, there we go. Um, however, um, <coughs> they're still really important economically along our coast. And if you just step back and you think about, well, what other serv ecosystem services do they support? Um, this is a uh, review by Dan Reed and Mark Krasinski. And we can look at just basically standing stock, stock of carbon within the kelp forest. And if you take a look across the global scale of things like tropical rainforest, seasonal forest, boreal forest, deciduous forest, evergreens, and so forth, um, we can see what their standing stock is. And if we take a look at the different kinds of kelp forest, laminaria, colonia, macros, our own macrocystis, they're pretty much on par as far as a standing stock of carbon as far as a unit area is concerned. If you throw in the understory algae, they could actually exceed as far as a standing stock of um, carbon. And if you look at their net primary production, once again, we're on par with some of the, the most, you know, what we think of as these big global forests. And they don't even actually exceed that as far as global uh, net primary production goes. So big impact, big players in the global carbon cycles. Um, the questions that really drive me are really disturbance related. And that they focus on what happens if we lose the kelp forest. What does that do to the ecosystem? Um, <laughs> this is a nice review by Mike Graham, your own Mike Graham here, um, published in Ecosystems. Well, we can look out at the California Channel Islands, and we can look at interaction webs um, and look at community structure where kelp forests are present. Nice thing that happens is there's a long-term data set from the Channel Islands. It gives us a really nice, powerful tool to look at, look at what happens when we lose those forests and we convert to urchin barren grounds. And some nice work shows that these interaction webs become much more simplified. We lose a large portion of the species, um, diversity goes down, and the complexity of the system goes down. And so really important to local scales and just diversity and, and the way communities are structured. <clears throat> some work I did with uh, Chris Wilmers and a colleagues, we looked at along the west coast of North America, extending from up here in the Aleutian Islands all down the coast, looking at areas where kelp forests have been lost and looking at the areas that kelp forests potentially could inhabit. Um, and then we would collect the kelps, look at their abundance out there, look at the carbon density in their tissues. And one of the things we notice is that where you have the forest, we might have a carbon density of about 0.18 kilograms per meter squared. That's on par with what some things I just showed you. Um, and when you lose the forest, you lose functionally 99 to 100% of that carbon storage. And so um, <clears throat> one of the, that just shows the, goes to show that when you lose these forests, you lose some of that standing stock area. <clears throat> However, that's kind of the, where I was, how I want to set up just the importance of the kelp forest. It's not where I really want to focus my talk today. Um, I want to talk about some work that's been going on up in the Aleutian Archipelago, off of the Alaska Peninsula. The Aleutians are a beautiful place to work. One thing that went up there, and I always thought it would be hard for a place to capture my attention and my love the way Baja did. Um, the Aleutians did. It was really surprised me. And when funding got difficult to keep up, after 12 years of funding Baja work, it became very difficult to keep it funded. Um, their funding was up in Alaska. I went up there and I started working with my <laughs> colleague Brenda Konar, where we've been working for about 10 years or a little bit more now. Um, the Aleutians are beautiful. Volcanic islands that extend right out of the seafloor go very deep, often snow covered. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, Chigadignac, Island of the Four Mountains. Just so you know, when you have sunny days in the Aleutians, you take pictures because it never looks like this. Um, the Aleutians are incredibly gray, incredibly foggy. Anybody ever spent some time out there? There's got to be a few, a few of you have. Almost always gray and foggy, kind of a dismal place to work above ground. But the below um, ocean uh, uh, system is really beautiful. So the dominant kelp that forms the canopy forming forest throughout most of the Aleutian archipelago is the um, dragon kelp Eularia fistulosa shown here. Um, they form these extensive forests historically throughout the, the fringing areas of the um, island chain. Above the water, it might look something like this. When we go down below the water, let's see. We had some technical things. Let's see if this works. Oh, it does. Excellent. Um, a forest below might look like something like this, incredibly <laughs> dense with um, Eularia in the background. This is all Laminaria or Saccharina, a whole host of other species. You can see our actually boat. It's very pretty to dive up there, too. That's our anchor line. Um, this is a former student of mine, Renato Boris Chavez, who um, did work on looking at the effects of kelp harvesting on the nutritional and uh, chemical properties of kelp. He's collecting some kelp for that analysis here. Um, but when you look at a kelp forest, this is kind of the historical state. Very dense forest, lots of underground, underwater biomass. That system has now changed. Um, and one of the stories put forth that many of you may, uh, may be aware of, um, 
predation, which is believed to be predation by the killer whales. I'm going to say right now, Moss Landing is a tough place to sell this one. Um, however, um, I'm going to simply say that you know there's um, a story that's been put forth um, by Jim Estes, one that I actually do uh, believe in, that um, predation by kelp forests preyed on sea otters. The sea otters took out the, um, when the sea otters disappeared, sea urchins. This is Strongylus and Trotus polyacanthus. Um, it's also been referred to as uh, Drabachiensis, but it's probably all polyacanthus. Have formed these really extensive urchin bearing grounds, an incredible biomass of, of urchins up there. They sit in this state. <clears throat> And the end result is when you dive the sites now, they look more like this. And so I'm going to show this video. Most people are looking at this uh, stellar sea lion. That's Mike Kenner. He's about 6'5". Um, this is a juvenile. These are very large sea lions. Um, <clears throat> but the take home is if you look in the background, a couple of Eularia, really it's all denuded of all the, the macroalgae. This is kind of the dominant state. When you dive up there and we dive 100 sites, 80% 80, 80 of them or more are going to be like this. Um, Lots of biomass loss. And the questions that I'm concerned with is, what happens when you lose the kelp? So this is SC's uh, classic Tropha Cascade, which is published in Science. The story put forth is a historical state, which is where we had lots of sea otter abundance back in the 70s and early 80s. Um, the sea otters had a big, strong imp impact on the urchins, which not, had knocked the urchin biomass down. When the urchin biomass was knocked down, we had low grazing intensity. Low grazing intensity had lots of kelp. Um, following the, the, um, the rena dietary renaissance of the, uh, the, kelp, uh, the killer whales, they knocked down the otters. Otter populations have decreased throughout the entire archipelago. Um, it used to be that when I started working up there in the early 90s, we would see hundreds, big rafts, 40, 50 at a time. We would see hundreds on the cruises. Um, the last cruise I went on in 21 days, we saw two otters the entire time, and we we're surveying for them. Um, the otters are primarily gone from this system. When the otters disappeared from the system, sea urchin biomass went up. That's very clear. Grazing intensity went up. That's very clear. And kelp density went down. So staying a bit out of the fray here, although I'm sure uh, Mike Foster will have something to ask me at the end of this. Um, but if I were to, to uh, cut the line right here and look at the, what happened due to this classic trophic cascade, which is really clear that this stuff has happened, my entire um, research program of the last 10 years or so has asked, what happens to the whole system when you lose that kelp? The kelp is gone from the system, um, or the vast majority of it is, at least. And so <clears throat> for those, um, just a, a little point of order, there's been a number of people who say that killer whales probably aren't doing this stuff. They're offshore. The whole time we were up there, killer whales were not foraging in the kelp beds. They're offshore. This is the killer whale. That is kelp trapped on its um, dorsal fin. This is actually one of our dive sites. I have been diving up there. The last dive I did up there, we saw the killer whales in the sites. We're diving. You can hear them clicking all around you. It's quite, it's a little unnerving, um, but you know, there's, there's never been a reported attack, so um, <laughs> we continued to work. Um, <clears throat> however, so this becomes where I want to spend my time today. What happens when we went from the kelp forest system to these um, urchin dominated systems with a little bit of kelp that are in these urchin dominated systems that typically sit on tops of little boulders or pinnacles where the water accelerates over the tops of these structures. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So this is what drives me. Uh, just some background to show that this is uh, the, the, some other changes that have gone with this. This is from a number of uh, Jim Essie's colleagues. This is uh, uh, Shauna Reiswitz, who was a student of my, uh, with me. Not of mine. She was a student with me at, uh, at Santa Cruz. And what we see is that when you go to the islands, that in the early 80s had already lost their kelp. They had low fish abundance. And we didn't see any changes up until 2000. But when you went to the islands that still had sea otters, still had kelp, what we see is that in the 80s, we had huge um, numbers of uh, green lean, which were associated with the, the kelp beds. And then when those, um, by 2000, when those kelp forests had disappeared, those numbers drop, dropped uh, dramatically. And so the overall fish abundance decreased. I'm going to come back to this graph later on when I talk about how fish are associating with the habitats later on. Okay, so clearly we saw a change in fish. Um, we can look at things like mussels and barnacles, um, where areas where we had kelp, they break apart, they become particulate. Um, they, they're good food for filter feeding invertebrates like barnacles and mussels. What we see is barnacles tend to be bigger on islands with, in areas with kelp. Um, mussels tend to grow faster on areas with kelp. So there's other wide-ranging um, consequences to the loss of kelp. Um, we can look at this up the food chain. This is uh, foraging by glaucous wing gulls. We see that in areas where there's kelp, 
they, pre they prey primarily on fish, take the kelp away, fish are no longer part of their diet. It's kind of the same story I just mentioned that the fish disappear. Um, sea urchins increase dramatically here. They become a much bigger part of the diet as well as other invertebrates. In addition, we might look at um, all the way up the chain to bald eagles. Once again, where you had kelp and you had otters, the bald eagles are uh, preying on otter pups. Um, when you take away the kelp and you take, lose the otters, the, the, um, they're less part of the diet. Fish, again, decrease just like we've seen. And birds, these are primarily eider ducks, um, become a much more part, uh, uh, bigger part of the diet. Eider ducks compete with the otters. When the otters disappear, these eiders um, populations have exploded. Their numbers are huge up there, and they become a, um, a bigger part of the, the diet. So putting this all together, a simple food chain might be something like this. However, what we really have is a complex food web that involves a lot of other players in the system. That's great. That's where I'm going to leave the story that's already been told behind. And I'm going to focus on things like ecosystem function. And today, what I really want to focus on are things. I've talked a little bit about carbon storage. I want to talk about the, how the physiology, partic particularly the kelps, have changed. Community stability, and that has to do with the urchins kelp forest boundaries between these two states. Fish habitat associations. And then I'll uh, end talking a little bit about uh, current NSF that Brendan and I just got to look at biodiversity and the ecosystem production that we're going to be doing over the next few years up there. Okay, so uh, let's see if it goes in. Getting back to the Aleutians, we have the kelp and urchin bear grounds. They occur like this. However, they often, as I mentioned, they generally occur on the tops of these boulders where the water accelerates and there's other mechanisms that allow the kelps to persist even in the face of this urchin grazing. Um, but they often occur with really sharp delineations between the two habitats, where you have the kelp beds and the barren grounds, and often, again, on the tops of boulders. So to look at this, um, some of these questions, uh, Brendan and I have been working up there. This has uh, occurred over a three-year period where we went up there. We worked in the Aleutians on two different ships. Um, one of them was the RV Tommy Thompson out of University of Washington. This is a 298 or whatever it was foot boat. Great boat to work on really overkill for what we were doing. I was on this boat for three weeks, and I never knew there was a gym on boat. My students knew there was a gym. I don't know why they weren't working in the lab, but they knew there was a gym, and they knew there was a movie room. I didn't, um, until, we, until they were talking about it afterwards. Um, so this is the, uh, the Tommy Thompson. Um, the other boat we worked on, I'm going to get an awe uh, from the audience, um, is the Point Sur, uh, now retired and moved on. Um, great boat to work on. I was able to take this through the Aleutians a couple of times. Um, I missed the boat, and when I put in for this year, I tried to get this boat, but uh, I think um, uh, Mike Prince, that's when he was at the retirement, was saying, I hope spring's eternal, but it didn't happen. So we're getting the Oceanus, which is also Stu Lamberton's boat. So um, for those of you who know Stuart Lamberton, he used to run this one, and the fact that he's one of my best friends and my old roommate, there might be a little bit of a perceived. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we worked on these boats, um, and then my colleague in this is Brenda Konar. This is generally the way most people know Brenda. Um, underwater. So the Aleutians, beautiful place to work. As I mentioned, you might look out the portal. Sometimes it looks like this. Most of the time, you'll, sometimes you'll get things like this. By the way, I'm a couple stories up. These are not little waves. Um, these are probably, I don't know, 15 foot seas or, so, or something like that. Um, <clears throat> we might go out to our dive sites. This is, will probably make my dive officer crazy. But this is uh, maybe a typical boat ride. This is between Kiska and Little Tiska. No, this is not a typical bar, boat ride. This is an extreme one. But <laughs> we're out there, and you look, this is looking backwards. We all know that looking forward on boats is often worse than looking, than looking backwards. Um, and so we would get up there. We would travel between the sites. The, the, the ship would anchor. We would crane the boats off. And then we would go do our work. And we would generally, it's light for all day, so you'd actually have a chance to be able to work um, all day in this stuff. So that's the Aleutians. That's kind of the, the fun part of it. Um, <coughs> getting to the stories now, the verses. So the, the first story I want to talk about is a comparison of dragon kelp fecundity, that's this Eularia, um, and the urchin barrens and the nearby kelp forests throughout the archipelago. The question I was uh, curious about is, when you lose the kelp forest and you lose those dense canopies, what happens? You increase light to the bottom. These are photosynthetic organisms. What does that do? So um, how do these habitats differ with respect to things like irradiance, photosynthesis, and does that infect kelp fecundity? So we can just simply go into these sites and go across a whole host of uh, barrens and urch uh, urchin barren grounds and kelp forests, take light measurements. They look like this. I'll just summarize them in these nice box plots. And what we see is that if you look at light in the kelp bed, 
It's shallower. The kelp beds are shallower than the, than the urchin barren grounds. Um, there's things with, when you get really shallow, hydrodynamic forces can get increase. Those hydrodynamic forces can keep the urchins at bay. Also, you're within the diving depths of some of the diving birds that are, that are in the system. So you end up with a situation where the kelp forests tend to occur a little shallower, where the urchins are um, not as heavily preyed upon, not as heavily taken out of the system. But even though the kelp beds are shallower, they have a, a lower irradiance, um, significantly lower. So they're darker, even though they're shallower. And that gave us this idea that, well, what's the relationship between the light and photosynthesis? One of the things we do in my lab is we take a, a physiological approach. It's something that I kind of got drug. I'm a quadrat ecologist. I like to you know, cage it, count it, cut it, things like that. Um, I had a, a Korean uh, colleague stay with, come and work with us for, uh, geez, it's been 10 years now, um, and brought physiology to my lab, which is where a lot of my students work now. However, if we look at the relationship and what we would simply call a P versus I curve, that is a photosynthesis versus radiance curve, for those of you who haven't seen these before, um, Standard notation for people who do work, deal with plants, or at least plant physiology. Um, we can look at a radiance from dark up to light, and then we can look at photosynthesis. And what happens, um, photosynthesis increases for a while, saturates, and then hits a, a thing where you give it more light and you don't photosynthesize anymore. This is based on oxygen uptake, or uh, sorry, carbon uptake or oxygen evolution. Um, there's a slight difference between those two. They're often uh, linked very closely, but there's really complex things that break the electron transport chain side, which is the oxygen evolution from the carbon uptake side or the, the carbon reduction cycle. But generally, they're pretty well linked. Um, but the take home from this is if we look at, say, an irradiance within a kelp bed, it might be right there, and a irradiance within an ocean barren right there, and what we're seeing is higher photosynthesis with more light. We could do this in the lab like this. We also do this with put these, the kelps in bottles and incubation bags. We put them out at different depths. In the field, we see the same thing. They photosynthesize more where the light's higher. That's not super surprising. But if they're photosynthesizing more, they're making more sugar. The question is, is more energy um, intake equal greater fecundity? Um, some of the people may look at it like this. I don't know for those of you who remember this. Um, <clears throat> however, the question, because as they're getting more food, what's going on, right? They're, they have more resources. They have more energy. So fecundity theoretically should go up. Brenda and I addressed this throughout the Aleutians, um, collected um, individuals, um, brought them back and looked at their fecundity on the ship. So the question, do uh, the Euleri growing in the ocean barrens exhibit greater fecundity than in the kelp beds? What we did is we went to them, we looked at randomly selected uh, spor uh, sporophytes, looked at their sporophyll mass by collecting them and weighing them. We then measured spore release per unit area on each of those sporophylls, so we got an estimate of fecundity per sporophyll. And then you can multiply the sporophyll mass by the spores released to get an estimate of relative fecundity. Right? And then we did this at seven islands um, spanning the range of interest, which was several, uh, many hundreds of kilometers. So this is what a sporophyll bundle looks like on a Eularia. Individually, these are what we would collect and bring back to the lab. Um, get spore release. And for those of you who have been out to sea, um, I was a lucky um, one who draw the short str straw, and I got to stare through the microscope for several days on end um, in the seas counting spores. Um, however, we would do this, and what we actually see um, is that if you look across a, these seven islands, you look at spore fill weight, what we see is a big effect of the barren grounds, which are the black bars, versus the gray bars, which are them in the kelp forest. These things are significantly bigger in the barren grounds. That's per plant. Each plant has a bigger spore fill mass. And then if you take a look at on those sporophyll masses, the amount of spore released per hole punches using cork bores, um, what we see is, again, a big impact where we have higher fecundity on the sporophylls in the barren ground. So they have bigger spore ma sporophyll masses, and those sporophyll masses per unit area are more fecund. So when you multiply them together, we get a very large impact of um, the kelp barren interface. We actually get much higher fecundity in the, uh, the, the barren grounds. The number of plants is much lower, true, but each plant is producing more spores. <clears throat> so to summarize this kind of first part of the story is that the Euleria and the urchin barrens do have greater fecundity than the Euleria in the, the kelp beds. They have bigger sporophyll bundles, once, and, uh, bigger sporophyll bundles, and once again, greater spore release per sporophyll area. And what we concluded on this is these individuals may co contribute disproportionately to spore settlement in the following year's recruitment. Now, it's true that the simple number of plants in the kelp beds may swamp this story. 
but this part of it is at least on a per individual basis. So that's the first story I want to tell. That's kind of the easiest story to just start off with. <clears throat> the next story I want to talk about is um, the stability of the kelp bed urchin barren grounds. Um, this is work that I did with Brenda and Jim. <clears throat> and we went in, and there's Brenda again, hiding behind this, the, the uh, thing. And so when it, this started with some observations. When we, start, we were working up there, Brenda did her PhD up there. Um, I went up with her when we first, she first started. I lived up there four months on the island of Shemia, which is a tiny little island, um, almost as far as the Commander Islands, almost as far as Russia. It's just, you can see Atu, which is the westernmost um, US island. Um, tiny little island, about three quarters of a mile wide, about two and a half miles long or so. You can run around it um, in a few hours. I know that because you get bored and you have to do something. Um, and so we would go up there. But one thing that we notice is that these kelp bed urchin barren grounds are often really sharply de delineated. The other thing we notice is we'd go back, and, we'd, and I, now I've been up to the Aleutians, I think, seven or eight times. And you go back to the same places, and those barren ground urchin um, interfaces appear to be in the same place year after year. And so that got us thinking about what's driving this. And so um, the way we looked at this is we thought these might be stable. And so we asked the qu simple question, how stable are they? And so we did this on a temporal, different temporal scales, long term from one to two years. We looked at their short term stability over one to two weeks. Um, and then we did this at different spatial scales at nine, island, uh, nine islands spanning about 800 kilometers. And we replicated these studies on each, at each island three times. That's about as much as we can do um, in addition, because these are side projects of, in addition to the big studies that we were doing up there. <clears throat> and so we'd go there, and you'd take a look at an urchin barren ground. What you could do is you could identify the kelp bed um, urchin interface um, where they start. You can actually map it out, and then you can look at, over a couple of years, how does that actual placement change? And so our general hypothesis was that they're stable for at least a year, and that we thought that physical abrasion by the kelp and the other algae inhibits urchin movement into the beds via the whiplash effect. And this maintains the barren ground uh, uh, positions. What this means is we thought that the simple water motion over the tops of these pinnacles and the boulders move those spore fills back and forth where they would just physically impede the urchins from inhabiting them. Brenda did some nice work in her PhD dissertation at Shemia um, showing that if you create artificial spore fill bundles, you can in inhibit the urchin um, movement in there. And so we did this um, <coughs> by going in and doing these, and then um, <coughs> by doing these studies. And so we looked at these positions. And then we said, OK, well, if you remove kelps from swaths in the, in, extending into the bed, will urchins then move into these swaths and establish a new urchin barren and a new boundary layers? So that was the idea going in. And that was going to, um, again, uh, result in new boundary positions. So just to show you something that it's not something about a chemical thing, I was asked once, is it chemical? These are spore fill bundles on weighted rods that we would look at grazing intensity. And as soon as the urchins find out they're there, they just, unfortunately, that's the time lapse photography stopped. But these just swamp it, and they eat it within an hour or two. The, the, it's not the spore fills or the physical presence of the kelp that's keeping them out. <clears throat> but kelp is in motion. And so if you take a look at the idea here is not to get everybody sick, um, but to watch the back and forth motion, right? We watch kelp go back and forth, and it moves back and forth with the swell orbitals. And that's fine. There's very little, pre um, very little force up here. But if you look down below, the spore fills are actually whipping back and forth on the bottom. The surface blades just may be going passively, but those spore fills are whipping back and forth. And that's what we thought was um, maintaining these, these things. And these things, these are on the tops of pinnacles, on tops of boulders, where that water accelerates greater. And so we thought that this was, uh, might be really important for keeping them at bay. This is some work I did in Baja, and um, that's why the, it's, the visibility is so bad. Um, but this is what kelp looks like, is that it goes over top of a pinnacle. You can imagine that being easily keeping an urchin that, um, from invading this, from inhabiting this area or moving in. So to test this. We did some long-term experiments where we went in. These, went over, uh, these were carried over one to two year period. We started these in 2008. And what we did is we simply marked the exact location of the boundary layer, boundary position between the two habitats. And we did this along 50 meter transects. We repeated this again at three um, urchin barren interfaces, um, urchin barren kelp interfaces on each island. And then we cleared all macroalgae from three meter swaths extending into the barrens 
um, or start from the barrens into the kelp beds. So we cleared out the kelp. And then we counted um, urchins in the swaths and the kelp beds and the adjacent urchin barrens. And then we repeated this at Nine Islands. And then in 2009 and 10, one and two years later, we went back in and we re simply resurveyed the boundary layers and examined the positions of those epoxy markers. And then we counted the urchins in each swath and the kelp beds and the adjacent urchin barrens. So this was what one of these things might look like. You can see a, a threaded bar there with a z-spar. There's more z-spar back here. Um, we can go in and we can actually, over a 50 meter thing, uh, follow these positions that, uh, along a 50 meter transect. We mark these things every meter. <coughs> and we came back, and believe it or not, we came back one and two years later and we're swimming up going, are we even going to be able to find these things? We anchored the boat, we drop in, and you're looking for these boundary positions, and they hadn't even moved by more than a few centimeters. They're the exact same position, very stable over a couple of years. And so that got us to asking, okay, well, if they're stable, what if you simply cleared an area here, created a little bit urchin barren there, um, will the urchins just move in and establish that as a new urchin barren? Or is there something that's fits about this area here that's not de dependent on the kelp, but it's just simply it's the top of the pinnacle or something that's keeping those urchins at bay? And so what this looks like is this is not, this is from Paul Dayton's uh, paper. This is not from the, the Aleutians. You can tell that's giant kelp. But it was a nice picture to demonstrate this. And so we can identify that barren urchin interface like right here. We could then go in, clear swaths into the kelp, have control swaths where we didn't um, clear it. We can watch the urchins move in um, over short time periods. And then we can come back a year and a half later. And this, if it's true that this whiplash effect is what's keeping them out, then what happens is we should expect to see these things remain a little urchin barrens two years later. And so we did this um, at, at uh, nine different islands. Here's the islands going out from Shemia all the way up to Chugadignac, which is the island of the Four Mountains. That's that beautiful set of islands I showed you at the beginning. Um, this is this little piece of whatever island I lived on. Um, and so we'd go to these things, and what, what these experiments look like this. You would have the urchin barrens, and then you would have kelp force, and then we would simply clear up into the kelp. And if you look at the data from these experiments, um, the data actually are incredibly clear. It's really nice when experiments work out like this. Um, we have the kelp side where we can look at the number of urchins. Forgive the uh, small pr print. That's a Mac PC thing, um, which we had to change at the last second here. I'm, it's amazing that the, um, that the videos worked, but my y-axis doesn't. You know, I always say, you know, if Bill Gates and Steve Jobs ever sat down and just had a beer at some point, my God, this life would be easier. Um, <laughs> however, <laughs> we can look at this, and what we see is at the very beginning, we see low urchin numbers on the kelp side, high urchin numbers on the barren side. No doubt, that's an urchin barren ground, that's not. Come back a year later and look at these swaths. And within a year, we have high urchin barrens here, not, no change there. Two years later, that little area that we cleared are urchin barrens for two years, and they look exactly like the densities in urchin barrens. We created small little three-meter urchin barrens, and they persisted for two years. It was incredible. And the, the virgin barren interfaces aren't moving. Something is driving, is keeping these guys incredibly stable. And we think it's this whiplash effect. Um, <clears throat> and so just to take a look at these things, we could take a look at our controls, our non-cleared beds, just to make sure that, you know, it's possible for those, I was talking to the marine ecology class today, you've got to have your controls. You never know if when you do an experimental manipulation, if that manipulation has some artifact that's actually, you get your result and you don't know if to what you're testing or some experimental thing that you just didn't think about, right? So we control for our experiments. Well, the easy control for this thing is repeat these kind of things, but in non-cleared areas. And so what we see is in non-cleared areas, once again, before, at the initial, we had very low densities. And then a year later, they stayed low. And two years later, they stayed, stayed low. Just the, on the barren side of it, we didn't see any changes. These look just like those, which look just like those. Don't clear it, and everything stays like that. It's pretty good evidence to show that whatever's maintaining these things, that physical presence of the kelp itself, and it looks like, again, the whiplash effect, is what's keeping these urchins out. Take that away, and the urchins can move in, and now there's a barren ground, and that persists. All right. <clears throat> but the question happens, well, that's clearing all of the kelp. What if we only cleared some of the kelp? Disturbances are not often not all or nothing. Um, and so they often take out just percentages of the populations. And so we're also interested in what about the annual species, things like Desmarestia, which is right there, 
things like us, um, some of you, Alaria. We can look at things like the perennial species, Agarum. Um, we can go in and we can do these experiments. And so we did this over a short-term period because we're interested in the very rapid recolonization of urchins moving in. And the question became, if you remove all the kelp, would the urchins go in just in a couple of weeks? Um, and if you remove only some of the kelp, would you see the same pattern? Or would just, does it just take some of the kelp remaining to cause the same patterns? And so here, we cleared different levels of macroalgae from experimental plots. And on, the, and on the kelp side of the borders, we cleared 100%, three quarters, half of it, a quarter, none of it. We cleared all the perennials, all the annuals. We counted the urchins in each plot at the time of clearing, one, and one to two weeks later, whenever we can get back there with the ship. Um, we, repeat, we repeated the counts on the urchin side of the boundaries in case we saw something interesting here, a huge decrease or a huge increase. It's just that we didn't see the same thing happened in the, un, in the urchin side of the boundaries. We just wanted to make sure that the urchin side were staying relatively constant during this. And we did this in three years, based on when we can get back to the islands. And so in 2008, we worked at the Rat Islands. And the next series of graphs, there's a lot going on in these graphs. I'm going to go over them pretty quickly, then I'm going to summarize them at the end, because there's too much going on with these things. You really need to take some time to sit down. But all the graphs have the same thing. We have urchin numbers on the y-axis here. And then this is the kelp side, where we did the uh, manipulations. This is the adjacent barren side, immediately adjacent to it. And we have the percent kelp removed, and that would be the barren side adjacent to that 100% removal, adjacent to the 75% removal. That's how these graphs are uh, uh, laid out. The black bars indicate what happened. The pre-clearing, we surveyed these right before we cleared them. We then went back a week later. And what we see is we start getting um, increases in these stars were, were, were significant. We see very little changes, a couple of changes, even some decreases here. But we see changes that are kind of scattered around and not always consistent within two weeks. E but even our, under the short term, we started seeing some changes happening, just not in a very consistent way. However, when you start looking at the, when you did this at enough islands, you start putting together the story at the end, that's where things become clear. Okay. Um, in 2009, we went to the Andranoff Islands. Um, here, we worked, we see the same thing. That's what the densities looked like before. This is what they looked like after. We, st we start seeing increases. Um, some decreases, again, very, some, some of it with no tendency. And then we went on to 2010, where we were able to re repeat these islands here. And we see the same thing. Here's what it looked like before. Here's what it looked like after. And you sit back there going, I don't see any super strong patterns. I see some increases here, um, some interesting things going on. But when you take a look at the data and you step back, the urchins significantly increase. These are statistical significant increases. In eight of the 11 sites where 100% of the algae were cleared. In 13 of the 22 sites um, where 75% of the more algae were cleared. In comparison, no changes were observed on any of the sites where no algae were cleared, and only small changes in the urchin barrens with no tendency. Sometimes up, sometimes no, but it's small changes. So what this told us is that you know, one to two weeks may not be enough time to see these huge patterns play out. We didn't have that much the luxury of that time up there. And so, but just in two weeks, we saw an effect of the clearing. What we saw was that even if you have um, some, just some algae remaining, that's enough to really inhibit it. You really need to take out almost all the algae for the urchins immediately to start to move in. So it does appear to be some impact of the presence of those kelps um, and the other algae keeping the urchins at bay. Okay, so the conclusions from the second uh, part of the study is kelp urchin barren grounds are stable for at least two years, and we didn't see them moving by even a few centimeters. The boundaries are maintained, apparently, through the physical abrasion by the kelps that, present those, that prevent those urchins from moving in. We call that the whiplash effect. Clearing the kelps re, um, reduces this effect and allows the urchins to move into the beds. And thereby, they set up new boundary positions. And then those new boundary positions remain stable. However, you, it's strongest when at least three quarters or more of the kelp are removed, or you remove all the perennials and the annuals. So you really need to take a bunch out of the system. Okay. So that's kind of the second story I want to tell. The third story has to do with the fish. Um, this is for Scott. I'm not the fish, uh, fish biologist um, by training. Um, you know, you work, you work with them. As your career gets on, you end up doing multiple things. Um, however, we, we're interested in looking at uh, local versus regional habitat influences 
Um, how it influences the assemb kelp fish assemblages in the diminishing kelp forest across the Aleutian Archipelago. Big title. Basically, the question is, what are the fish doing? How are they associating with the habitat? And so, once again, we went back up there on the Point Sur, and we're working in where, where we were able to find these dense kelp beds and in the urchin barren grounds, um, where we have just some barren grounds, um, the, the urchins surrounding these uh, canopies of Eularia. But this is a very different kind of habitat. And so, <clears throat> the question centers on this. At the local scale, the loss of the dominant habitat, uh, you lose the dominant habitat, habitat forming kelps, easy for me to say. Um, basically, you're losing the foundation species. This, these are the force of the ocean, right? When you lose those, and you end up with something like this, which looks very different than a thick, rich kelp bed, the question is, how does it impact the way the fish associate with these different habitat characters? And how do these associations compare with, say, large scale, that is, regional oceanographic characters, such as those you might observe on the op opposing sides of biogeographic breaks? So, to said I'd return to this one. The evidence from when we lost the kelp is an overall uh, decrease in fish abundances. That was pretty clear. There's not nearly as many fish up there. But it doesn't tell us how those fish associate with the habitat. The kelp forests are pretty much gone from the system. A lot of these things are just barren grounds. And there's still fish in them. So we were curious on what are the fish associating with. So <clears throat> the biogeographic breaks come from this. If you look at the Aleutian Archipelago coming off the Alaska Peninsula, we have the Alaska Coastal Current, which is limited really to um, about the, the eastern Aleutians. And then you have the Alaska Stream and the Aleutian North Slope Current. And so you have Boldier Pass and the Samalga Pass. These are pretty well-known biogeographic breaks, where you have changes in species assemblages on the opposite sides of them. You have changes in oceanographic conditions. So really, what, what we're curious about is these local-scale losses of reefs and how they compare to large-scale oceanographic features. It's a scaling issue. And so we went in. We looked at 30 sites on 15 islands, shown here, um, out here in the western Aleutians, in the central, and in the eastern Aleutians. Um, this covered 1,500 kilometers, and we looked at 25 fish species. Um, and this is with uh, Terrell Efford, um, if any of you know him. Um, he was a student at Alaska Fairbanks. He's with NOAA Corps now. Um, and this was primarily his thesis work. So everything, when I say we, I'm you know, taking the plural, pluralistic way of saying him. Okay? Um, and so what Terry did, um, went in there, and he looked at fish species composition, fish abundances at each of these. And then looked at different habitat uh, parameters, 25 in total. We looked at things like the, kelp, uh, the canopy kelps, this primary eularia in the eastern Aleutians, you run into the bull kelp near Asistus. Um, we looked at six species of understory kelps, um, substrate a cover of five different species, understory algae and crusting invertebrates, kelp forest size, um, depth, rugosity, bottom type, salinity, temperature, all these physical things. And so we're able to measure what's going on at these islands and at the sites we're working. And since we've covered such 1,500 kilometers and we've got 30 sites now that we're working, the idea was, can we find the way that fish associate differently with these? And can we find that certain species associate with some characters while others associate with other characters? <clears throat> the way this worked is, this is 100% terrible. I love this little pictorial he does. We would take the inflatable. He even drew the floorboards on this thing. Um, <clears throat> we would uh, encircle a kelp bed. <clears throat> with, and with the GPS, we get waypoints, and now we can do, uh, convert this to a shape file, get its, the canopy area. So now we have an estimate of kelp forest size. <clears throat> we would then survey the edges of the forest, survey the inner part of the forest. Again, we. Um, <clears throat> and then we do visual transects um, for the fish down uh, swaths 50 meter by 2 meter by 2 meter, basically corridors. We would count benthic and midwater fish, and then we would count them all, and identify them and count them. And so this would look something like this. The divers would go along the benthic and the midwater, survey for fish. Once they had finished that, they'd turn around, and then they would go along the bottom with their RPC bars and their quadrats <coughs> and survey the benthos with a density and bottom cover of different things. Once that was done, they'd turn around, take their flashlights, look under cracks and crevices, and look for the cryptic species. So. I'm um, pretty sure we got a good uh, estimation of what's there, both in the physical habitat and in the species um, composition of the fish. <clears throat>
And so <clears throat> I always tell my students, and this may get me in trouble, some people don't ever do pie charts, but I personally don't like them very much. So, here, so here's my pie charts. Um, sometimes they are the way you, you can look at things. Um, and so we can look at different species across the Aleutians, um, and they, the species assemblages look like this. These data can be analyzed with a permutation analysis of variance, a permanova, um, say in primer E, um, straightforward technique. The beauty of doing a technique like this and with multivariate data is it essentially converts things into a Euclidean or Bray Curtis distance, which means it breaks things down into a univariate test. Once you take multivariate data, break it down into a univariate test, you can actually do variance partitioning, you can do post hoc tests, everything you can do with an ANOVA. It's a really nice tool. Um, and we can actually look at these huge differences between regions explained about 10% of the overall variation in fish assemblages. Islands within regions, about a quarter, and sites within islands, about half of it. This idea that the sites within islands, which are really our replicates, have most of the variation as you scale up and less and less of the variation occurs at very large scales. And this is kind of an axiom of sam field sampling. You know that if you're out there count counting kelp, for those of you who do, um, you can swim this way. You might run into two kelps. You might run into five or seven. You might run into a three-fold difference. It's hard to imagine that three-fold difference repeating itself over and over and over and over at larger scales. We tend to just have stochastic processes and just, um, just randomness and things like that have add a lot of variation to our sample units. So it's not surprising we have most of the variation at small scales. That's pretty straightforward. But the thing that really takes home from this is that when you look at the fish assemblages and their abundances in the kelp beds versus the urchin barren grounds, it explained about 2% of the variation in fish. Things have changed up there. In the, there's no longer these big differences between the two habitats. It's really all one kind of habitat. It's almost all urchin barrens up there. Um, and there's really very little difference between when you have a kelp forest and when you have the fish. Um, mostly just because the kelp forest makes such a small percentage of the available habitat up there. It's what we think. But anyway, something's changed. <clears throat> and so we can look at an MDS plot to kind of look at things, things that are points that are closer together are more similar, things that are further apart are more dissimilar. Don't read any more into that. There's no quantitative assessment here. But if we look at the regional comparison, which I said explained about 10% um, of the variation, it, there's, it's significant. The regions actually are significantly different from one another. And the, what's causing them is the east is different from the central. The east is different from the west but the west and the central aren't different. There's actually more kelp forests remaining in the, um, in the east, and that's the one that's really different from the others. So what's apparently happening is it's kind of this regional scaling thing going on where over very large scales, we can pick up this difference between the regions, and it's probably due to the fact that we either have these big bio differences in biogeographic breaks, or it's because there's more kelp forests remaining in the east. And when you look at the western and the central Aleutians, they're not any different. That's where these barren grounds are really um, far more dominant. So <clears throat> um, uh, regional comparisons there. Uh, we can go in, once again, look at the kelp bed versus barren habitat. And again, they are not significantly different from one another. <clears throat> um, and so the other thing that we notice is of those, um, the 25 fish taxa that we observed, really 55% of the variation among regions, we can now actually use a tool called the similar percentage analysis, which allows us to go in and you go in on the untransformed data, you're able to determine what is the contribution of each species to these observed differences. And what we see is really four groups, the rockfish, the cods, the green leaves, and the sculpin are what are driving the differences in the fish assemblages at this regional scale. <clears throat> All right. And so then what we're curious about, if we go in, all right, well, that's what happens if you look at the, the, the regional scale. And I mentioned before that it might be due to the fact that you, there's just more kelp in one area than the other. We can go into these sites, and we can say, all right, let's get rid of the data re, re, uh, relating to the barren grounds, and let's just focus where we were able to measure kelp forests. And we went in, and we still see this regional difference. And the same thing, the west and the central are, are um, not different from one another. The east is different from the west, and the east is different from the central. The east is different, regardless if you're considering the kelp bed urchin, um, urchin barren ground together, or if you're just looking in the kelp beds. There's something going on on a large scale. 
And we can look at, go to the kelp edge, just look at the edge of the forest versus the inside of the forest. And again, we see no difference there. So <clears throat> this is actually pretty surprising to us, because we went in thinking that we would see a huge impact be where you had kelps and you didn't. And within the kelp beds versus the edge of the forest versus in it. That's what we went in. We were flat out wrong. Um, and <clears throat> what appears to be happening is there's lots of small scale local variation going on which we can't fully, the experiments weren't designed to really test all that, but we can identify it. We can identify how important it is. But what we're beginning to see is that there is this huge regional difference that seemed to correspond with these biogeographic breaks. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> getting back to the question of what's driving it, now we've got all these data. We actually, there's some analysis um, that we can do. And this is going to be um, <clears throat> using a global best test. We're going to use the BioN procedure. Uh, and essentially what this does is it takes of all your habitat variables and you, all your fish assemblage variables, you can take your fish assemblage, create a similarity matrix between them. That is, you can look at the similarity between every pair pairs of samples you have and rank them from the most similar to dissimilar. You could then go in and randomly select two of your habitat variables out, do a, do a resemblance matrix on those, figure out which two sites were the most similar, which two were the most dissimilar, and rank them right alongside your biological one. Then you can pull every pair of two out. Then you can pull every pair of three out, every pair of four, all the way up to every pair of the 25 out. At some point, you're the relationship, the correlation between the fish assemblage and the habitat variables will, will peak where you've got those variables that are really driving the system. And as you start adding more variables which aren't driving the system, you start breaking that correlation, and your correlation starts going down. So it's a nice procedure that uh, allows us to go in and find out what subset of the habitat variables are most strongly related with the fish assemblages in looking at differences between your pairs of samples. And so that's the basic uh, analysis um, here. And so what we found is of the 25 habitat variables considered, we only found five of the variables that were most important. You start adding more of those in, and it starts to break this down. And these were things like understory of kelp density, percent cover of understory algae, encrusting algae, availability of bedrock, uh, percent cover of cobble. Um, however, even though we've identified five, I start going, you know, are these really that important? You know, there's other variables I can think of. Um, you think these are not even significantly related to the fish assemblage. It's not a significant correlation. There is no subset of variables that we could find that was significantly correlated to the fish assemblages, um, which is something that's very different than we had seen in the past, and again, was completely counter to what we thought going in. The take home from that, again, is things have changed. The fish do not seem to be associating strongly with any of these habitat variables up there. Their overall numbers are down, but we can't figure out, we don't know at this point what they're associating with. Um, an idea that I think may be happening, I was talking to Doug Rasher about this, is that, um, <coughs> that when you've, uh, the, the Aleutians, we've also not only lost the sea otters, but the stellar sea lions and the harbor seals are pretty much gone from the system too. Um, their numbers are really low. And so you've got these fish predators that are, that are completely reduced in numbers at the same time your fish, your fish numbers are down. And so what we think might be happening is there might be some sort of a fear component going on where you've taken that, uh, that fear out. So these things are now open. They're not hiding. They're not cryptic. They're not um, associated with these habitats where they're, where they're trying to protect themselves. We're actually going to test that this year by trying to look at specifically targeting our sampling to areas right near the rookeries that are, that are persisting versus things uh, distance away from the rookeries. And we're going to see if the association changes based on how close you are to the rookeries. And if we're true, we should see near the, the rookers where you still have these predators, we might actually start to see these things are associated with things they can hide in. But we don't know that. That's something that is a hypothesis. We're going to test it this year with, uh, uh, um, with Scott, Scott Cabarra, those of you who knew Scott. He's in my lab right now doing a PhD. That's one of the side projects he's taking on when we're up there. All right. So conclusion from this last part, where the fish reef assemblage appeared to have changed since the 1980s. They're no longer associating so strongly with kelp. There's weak associations with other aspects of the reef that I've mentioned. The variation in fish assemblage, however, appears to follow a scaling issue, where sites are more variable than islands and regions. That's not surprising. Um, but they're not impacted by the kelp versus barren ground or by position in the kelp bed. That was, not, that was surprising. Um, there's non-uniform fish assemblages across the chain, and they tend to be dominated, again, by cods, rockfish, greenling, and sculpins. sculpins. And given all this, even with the, the change that have occurred up there, we still see this really important 
import, the importance of biogeographical breaks um, that describe for offshore systems, they appear to agree with the regional patterns of the fish, fish associations. So, <coughs> um, and these things are supposed to pop in as I was saying these things, and so there's our fish, number two, and then um, there's the, uh, the, the large scale stuff showing the biogeographic breaks. Okay, um, <coughs> so I'm gonna end with the stuff we've done there, and we're uh, running out of time here, and so, <coughs> We've, I've talked today about phys seaweed physiology and reproduction, the urchin stability, habitat loss. Um, Brenda and I have an NSF where we're going to be spending the next couple summers up there. Looking at, as you've lost the kelp beds, we're going to be looking at what's happened to biodiversity. We can go out there and count the big things, but big things aren't biodiversity, right, folks? You've got to get down. You've got to count the tiny little things all the way down to the worms and the smallest little crustaceans if you want to get a biodiversity. So we're going to take a look at what's happened to, to real biodiversity up there. Um, I've, we're, we're going to continue on looking at carbon uptake and storage. Um, we're going to look at ecosystem production. We've got a series of benthic ch respiration chambers that we're going to be deploying up there along with shipboard incubations to look at when you've lost the kelp, what's happened to net ecosystem production. And then the last thing is we uh, believe that we found evidence of uh, bald sea urchin disease up there. Um, we found it on about seven islands. Um, we're cur currently working with a group at, with Forest Rowers Lab um, who, is a, who came and gave a talk last year here. And as our disease person, we're looking at viruses and, and the microbes associated with disease outbreaks. And we've got an NSF that we submitted um, to do work out there to try to look at if these diseases do occur, how are they going to spread to the urchin populations? So <clears throat> that being said, I want to just um, thank uh, the funding, obviously, um, particularly NSF and the UNALs. Um, uh, thanks for taking us up there. The, the, the Point Sur and the Thompson, a whole host of uh, field crews. Um, <clears throat> And then um, that's my version, my, my group, the beer pigs, and then Brenda, who's probably somewhere underwater right now. Um, so I'm going to leave this there, um, and uh, thank you for having me here. And take on any questions. <laughs> we will start with what they call murder row, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll be easy. It'll be hard time. <laughs> On the Alaria, the warfare production thing, mm -hmm. so does it translate? I imagine mean, it does, yeah. Because I just think, I mean, Mike would better address this than I, but um, I'm not <laughs> sure if that relationship with Holt and Black Cal Force, because it has location, right? Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, um, did that, your data suggest that if they translate, they don't do much because it's the light that's driving it on the box? Um, so I'm going to, a slight opposite, opposite argument to that and say that I think that they may translocate, but translocation now is that you've still got what's at the surface in a, in a sitting there. But you, within a forest, you've got that whole body of photosynthetic material in the water that is shaded. Even if they're translocating what, what's at the surface, it may be translocating down. Then you've got to integrate that throughout the entire house. And we go in and we look at these, the entire water column happens to be brighter within but isn't that true of the jack out? I mean, yeah. So, but as far as I know, um, you don't get those differences in spore fill production. Right? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm trying to think if I, the only person I would know that really probably look at that is Dan. Well, that's not Mike. Mike. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't think he's going to look at macrosystems at all. I mean, all you know in macrosystems is that when you remove the canopy, the spore will affect it, but whether or not there's any shading impact on spore production, I don't think it's been seen in China. So, in your second um, scenario, if they were you know, clearing the cap, mm -hmm. um, thinking that this whiplash thing was on the lower parts of the plant, did you try to just remove the lower parts and see, just leave the stalk with that? We didn't do that. We did not do that experiment. That's a, that's a good experiment to do, um, to remove just to remove the, the spore fills themselves and see if you get the same kind of response. Um, be a great thing to do. Um, you know, when we're out here, we're doing uh, actually doing a bunch of other kind of work up here, um, and so we're actually doing this between dives. Like we're, you know, we're we're finishing work. We've got okay. We've got a half a dive to do this. So we're kind of running all day, so doing as much as we can. Right. Um, that would be a great experiment to do. It's the it's, you know, you can do one, two things. You can leave the plant and remove the spore fills, or you can have spore fills and no plant. And we've done that spore fills and no plant. We just did it with artificial spore fills, and we see the same effect. Um, but we haven't done that experiment.
I had another related question to yourself with Brenda. It looked like all of the uh, artificial barrens that you cleared mm -hmm. had one border that was adjacent to the actual barren. Mm -hmm. Did you ever try or think to try making an artificial barren inside? No, but that's, we're going to do that this year, actually. And the, the reason why we're going to do this is um, as Forrest and I were actually, as things happen over years, um, and we were having, and this actually happened last Friday. Um, and we started talking about this stuff because I had given a, um, a seminar on this stuff uh, at San Diego State. And he started talking about um, dissolved organic carbon, right? And this then laid out forms of dissolved organic carbon. And so he's looking at these things which may be much higher with the health force. And one thing that he thinks is happening is these things, when you have a lot of that stuff, it tends to really favor um, microorganisms, things like viruses, and things that would become disease vectors. And so he's actually, he's completely convinced that if you were to just go in and you were to add sugar to these things, that you would actually end up with diseased urchins. And so he thinks that um, within the kelp forest, um, you end up with these things in the side of the kelp forest, and you just can't have lots of urchins in there because it might be a good um, way for diseases to, to operate. He's having a hard time convincing me of that, um, but we're going to do some of those experiments. Mm, cool. Yeah. What happened at Tanaka Island? It was the one graph that was different. You never out. expect everything to go the same way. It's biology. Could it be an aspect of the, of the, of the experiment? Probably not, because doing the kind of these stuff that helps is like cooking in the kitchen is super easy to do. Um, you treat everything the same, but you know you never expect. I never expect all my data to always be the same way. That's my cop out answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So Matt, a little bit more detail on the stability of your urchin kelp boundaries. Wow. Um, you've been showing everything, it's mostly Eularia and that whole whiplashing, but Eularia is an annual and it's not present in the winter when the waves are the biggest. So why aren't the urchins moving in during the winter time when the Eularia is naturally gone because of its- Oh, no, so um, if, when you look at some of those pictures where I have the Eularia the urchin barrens around, that applies it. So when you just have the Eularia, you take that away, the urchins do tend to move in, with the exception on the top of these boulders and the tops of small things, which, um, as the water accelerates, you can sort of climb up, up on top of them. Where you have the Eularia beds on the top of those, of those pinnacles, you have really dense um, perennial kelps. Okay, so that's what I was trying to get. Is the detail here is that it's probably the perennial kelps. It's, the, it's most certainly um, the, the perennial kelps. Yeah, I talk about the sporophiles going back and forth because that's something that is I mean, it's part of some of the other stories we're thinking about sporophiles. But when I showed some of the pictures of, um, like in Baja, where you have the, the Icenia actually moving back and forth, and you look at some of these kelp that's like there's saccharina, there's um, uh, laminary species, these things can be really abundant. So then that, those are really that sets up a follow up question then. If that's the case, then you wouldn't expect in areas without otters to see Eularia dominated beds because every year they'd be moved into by the urchins. Mm -hmm. You need the perennials to actually facilitate the Eularia production every year. Yeah, and so and what we see is, uh, that's true, and what we see is in the areas. Um, like those areas, we don't tend to see the beds occurring on flat bottoms. We tend to see them, as I've shown them, on the tops of pinnacles, where there's another mechanism going on where water just accelerates over the tops of these things. So in this case, the perennials do facilitate the Eularia, which is the big I think, uh, we think, yeah, we do think so, yes. Um, and actually, there's an interesting uh, relationship between all the this Eularia and these perennial cups. And it, there's some evidence, we're actually looking at this right now, where the Ewell area is where the, the canopies already may have actually expanded a little bit from competitive release mm -hmm. because you've taken out these understory kelps, which actually inhibit the Ewell area also competitively. And so we're trying to look at that right now. We're using, I'm working with Kyle, um, and trying to look at um, big areas using satellite images going back to the 80s <coughs> and coupling those with the survey data to look at place by place if there's been a change in the Ewell area distribution and the canopy distribution. Matt, like in a picture like this where the, it's uh, calm and the, okay, the canopy is really thick, if you were to drive through that uh, on a ship or you know, with a surfboard, could you measure a change in pH on one side of the fruit? Very much so. Yeah, I'm, I, that's, I've done a ton of work with that. Um, we've got thousands of samples from throughout the evolution of British Columbia that done. And yeah, you pick up, you only have to go in at five, ten, nine to ten meters, five meters into the picture. That you find precipitous change in the carbon speciation. 
I imagine uh, locally. So, because you said, don't think that it's ever like this. Oh, uh, 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 <laughs> so as I think so, as I got one. So the next day, would the uh, change in chemistry be wiped out? Is it uh, you know? Uh, yeah. So um, what we looked at is um, so the only way I can think about that is. Um, it's very small beds versus big beds. Small beds, as the water goes through, tends to go through the bed pretty, pretty easily. You don't get those changes. The big beds tend to have their own kind of internal boundaries, uh, internal characteristics. So to answer that question, I think if you had a huge hydrodynamic bed that mixed the water that they were just homogenizing with what's outside. Um, we know from work by, say, George Jackson down in uh, San Diego, um, that we look at, like, in the Point Loma, of course, once these beds get big, these internal characters really have a very different surf beat, curl beat than they do outside. They actually are really have a very good buffer zone. The kelps are really good at kind of diminishing out the back those hydrodynamic forces. So um, I would think that if you had a, a, an event that was able to replace that water, that that would negate that effect. I, I don't want to take too much, but you, when you say precipitous, do you mean like a change in pH? Of Up to a 50% drop in uh, PCO2 values. Um, and so we PCO2, PCO2 but that's going to um, go be coupled along the sides because we also measured the carbon by carbon sides, so the whole carbon budget. Um, and so those are going to come with changes in the pH. Yes. Well, and I'm only asking because it, throughout your talk, it, it seemed like it was uh, it's the biological interaction, possibly uh, very heavy on the um, physical part, the abrasion and the sporophylls whipping everybody into shape. But uh, no, no uh, mention other than at the very end of the chemistry of the water in the locale. That's mostly because that's, I have an entire seminar that I give on that process. Uh, um, it's, it's an hour long seminar because we've looked at, um, like I said, in the outside of the forest, we've looked at temporal coverage. We've actually looked at microhabitats, where it looked like in a spore flow, water was moving under, a, a, like, where, you know, urchins and outlining might hang out back under a, um, under a, a ledge and stuff. And, you get these, just over the scale of a meter or two, you get these huge changes, doubling and tripling of the carbon mutation. So it's incredibly variable. But within kelp forests, um, I think there's new evidence coming out. I have a Hertz group is, has a new paper out I'm looking at. Kelp forests really have these bio, the biological process in the kelp forest can really swamp these external kind of climate change driven patterns. Um, and so I should also point out that um, you know, I've shown these pictures of how bad it can be up there. Those are extreme. This is actually, you know, we're, we're working up there. We're, those other ones, we're not diving like that very often. Most of the time, you get conditions like this. I would be really over the top before. Um, you get a lot, you know, up there, that it's, uh, the nice thing about the evolutions is you don't have a huge fetch. But you have, so you don't tend to get these big rolling swells. That's an easy place to dive. Um, swell beat tends to be lower. When there's really strong winds, um, we tend not to go out. That picture that I showed you was those winds came up during the day, so we had to travel back in them. Uh, but we would never leave the boat in conditions like that, so we don't actually go out in those conditions very often. All right, let's thank Matt. And then we have happy hours, so stick around and ask them more questions. <laughs>